everyone, welcome to the Torvis podcast. After a uh, delay, Jason, Alex, and myself, Ari, we are back. And this is season two, actually, of the Torvis podcast. This is going to be episode three, and we have a special one today. We've been talking about it for uh, a little while now, and it's going to be our favorite toys from childhood. Now, the thing about toys, we all have specific toys that we remember. Jason and I are both Gen Xers, so we remember toys from the 70s and 80s. And then you have Alex, who is a millennial, but he remembers stuff, obviously, from the 90s. And uh, we're going to be kind of blending what our favorite toys are. So we're going to have some special ones, uh, ones that you probably have forgotten about that uh, we're going to bring back into your memory. So welcome, everyone, to the Torvis Podcast and uh, the favorite toys of all time. So we're gonna get kick it off right now and we'll kind of do a countdown from uh, to our number one toys, but we're gonna start off our kind of our number fives. So we're gonna start off with Alex and uh, Alex introduced us to a toy that Jason and I really didn't know about. So it's his number five and go ahead, buddy. Yeah, wildly popular in the 90s. That's pretty much my primary reason uh, for mentioning it. And I still remember when I did, uh, my mom finally caved and, uh, and ended up purchasing me one because all of my friends had them. Uh, but I'm talking about uh, Tamagotchi, uh, which is a little handheld virtual pet. It's uh, about this big in size, sort of an egg shape. Initially, they came out with some other shaped ones as it became more popular. Uh, built-in little keychain hanger uh, so you could put it on your keys I guess and essentially it was just a little sort of uh, Pokemon like little there were little rabbits or different uh, types of little pocket monsters that you just had to kind of there was three buttons and you had to be responsible for feeding them and exercising them and giving them water uh, and yeah it was a weird little way to you know if you didn't have a pet to cling to that having a pet when I lived in an apartment my, my mom never let me have any animals so that was kind of like a big moment for me what would happen. happen to them if you didn't feed them and take them for a walk would they die they got sick they never died it was it wasn't uh they never really <laughs> traumatized the kids oh my thing died. yeah like you had to clean up the poo and stuff and uh you know they're it would become uh messy and they they looked quite lethargic like they did look like they did become ill from my memory, but I, you, I don't think you could uh, kill them as far as I remember. I think maybe later they had ones that they would, there was ways to have them lay eggs um, and then you could uh, have multiple, like it became quite the uh, sort of uh, empire at one point where you were able to link them together and they right. could go on dates with So you got other. your friend that had a bunny also and you got them together and then you got a bunch more of them? Yeah, yeah, that's kind of how they would uh, they would work. They were there. It was I never, like I said, I never got super into it, so I don't know exactly all the details on all the functions. I just I definitely was a part of that fad, mm -hmm. and anybody who uh, either had a kid in the '90s or was a kid in the '90s should uh, definitely know that reference. Interesting. Yeah, that's something that uh, I just when you mentioned it, Jason and I kind of went, we don't know what that is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, originally released in uh, 1996 in uh, Japan. And then a year later, it came all around the rest of the world. And awesome. uh, yeah, it's, it's funny, like you I, I showed you a little picture of it briefly there, but uh, yeah. you probably recognize it to, to see one but uh, well, what you'll see is uh, on this podcast, obviously down below, you'll see uh, I'm going to be putting the pictures of whatever toy we're talking about so you can see the, v the viewer can see what we're, we're going on about. Uh, so Jason, so he had, that was, it was a Tamagotchi or Tamaguchi? Tamagotchi. Tamagotchi. So I, wanted to, I wanted to ask about, because I've never heard of these things. Well, I, I, mean, guess, I, I guess I've kind of seen them in passing, but never paid much attention because, yeah. Yeah, was, and honestly, like I could. university then, so. It might have a different pronunciation in Japanese and I might be like victim to just like what it was called on the schoolyard playground. Like that's entirely possible, but I called them Tamagotchi. I know. Yeah. Know. Do you Not have me. one still? No, no, I don't. I no, I don't. That guy. That they might guy be coming back into collectors thing. So like you said, it was like 90 what? 96. Like, yeah. So it might be a time to get back into them before they take off again. Nostalgia kicks in after a certain period of time. So if we only had a machine. Yeah. Well, I'm just saying it. Maybe if they're still functioning, maybe you could hack them now with new technology. Maybe make a Raspberry Pi version <laughs> of them. 
So here's the thing about geeks. Uh, a lot of geeks are collectors. And uh, I put this out on Facebook and on the Instagram account and people started saying, hey, I have this and sending me pictures of stuff they still have. Uh, your buddy Tom uh, sent me some pictures of toys that he still has. So it, yeah. it does happen. Yeah, he has some great stuff. Yeah. Okay, Jason, so that was Alex's number five. How about you? What would be uh, starting your list off here? Starting starting in from the from the bottom there. Well, I have six listed because I figured we were going to do one as shared. So I'm going to go with the bottom of my list here being hockey cards, NHL, and it was WHL. That was the a lot of the teams that you know now as part of the NHL that I think of as the new teams that are not yep. really that new, like the Oilers and stuff, which they came in and joined the league. And so you got like, so I had like Gretzky rookie cards and all kinds of cool things. So it was a really, really big deal in school when, when I was in school. And so we, you not only did you collect the cards and, you know, get all the, all the sets and the teams and you'd trade them between the, between each other, but you also played these games with them. So we had, uh, there were wallsies where you, you so you'd take the cards and you would, uh, yep. Do I have anything that's a card-like thing around here? You think I would? It doesn't have something written on it that I don't want. Anyway, so you take a card and you like throw it towards a wall. And so wallsies it was kind of like curling. You'd get it where it was. Oh, sorry, but really Canadian today, I guess. Um, <laughs> you would get as close to the wall as possible, and then if you whoever gets it closest to the wall wins the wallsies game. As I remember it, someone can correct me if my memory is wrong. This is mm -hmm. forty years ago, right? So it's a long time ago whenever that was. Um, and it's a wallsies and you have noxies. So you'd, you'd line cards up and you'd lean them up against the wall and then you'd throw these ones in there and you'd knock them, knock them down. So those are two of the games I remember was wallsies and noxies. I'm sure there was a lot of other ones, but the haze of time and my fading memory. But hockey cards was just a giant fad and teachers had confiscated them. I often joke that one of my teachers just probably retired just on hockey cards from those things because all those Gretzky rookie cards when he was just some young punk. And now people probably like Gretzky who, right? But I don't know. So here's the thing. It was a big deal then. So the hockey cards is a very interesting thing because I remember using hockey cards in our, uh, on our bicycles to make them sound like motorcycles with a, with a safety clip. And the other thing is, so one of the big companies back then was uh, OPG, I believe that's what they were called. And they had gum in the packs. Yeah. Of the hockey. Now, Alex, you hockey cards and stuff like that are you you're aware of them right i i know of them uh but i never uh, you know my only experience is through the auction house they came in quite a bit right uh, and so we we got to see them but uh yeah i know not really something that was popular amongst my so friends. were they worth anything in the auction house like do people still no they're the right ones are definitely worth something but we would get in entire collections that people had and we'd have one of our head auctioneers go through it and yeah. he would know what to look for and we'd sell like a person it's kind of sad like if somebody passed on and their kids didn't want all their cards we could have an entire person's collection of like you know it would be like what our magic cards are just like boxes and boxes of these things probably like five or six of those big case white boxes mm -hmm. yeah. sell maybe a hundred bucks right like it, it, it you just you have to know the specific one i think to have value because uh, i think playing cards uh just kind of became really saturated after that initial fad yeah um, and then you know uh i think like i'm how did you get your first hockey cards did they come in like foil packs or what, how, uh, what it was packs i don't think things were foil back then foil no, was were, like a they were plastic and you could pick them up at convenience stores. Uh, everywhere. 7-Eleven. And again, Alex, they had, they had pieces of gum in them, these little stale uh, pink pieces of gum. So the hockey cards would smell like bubble gum. Oh, okay. So that's like picking up like a, a Pokemon or a Magic the Gathering pack and having gum in them. You know, it's, it's so it's, weird. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. what happens if it gets like too hot too? If the truck driving them over gets really hot, did your gum ever like melt into your card? Like no, because this gum was disgusting. It was made out of plastic. Yeah. Oh. I don't know what that, those, yeah. But they were right by the till. There was like a box yep. of them right there, and any convenience store you'd go in. This was when Seven Eleven actually meant seven to eleven. You know. Yeah. So what, one thing that I hadn't thought about um, that I'm now going to mention because it ties into the hockey things because my dad had a tabletop hockey game. Oh, yeah. Uh, 
little metal figures that I believe you had to mail away for certain teams because it was only of the original teams. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember playing that quite a bit with him, you know, where you, you'd have to twist them. Yeah, up. yeah. And it the had little... the sticks where you could do it, like the lot, you pull them out and back and turn them yeah. around. They had those rails that they went on. Oh, yeah, those, that was great. And, yeah, and played you played a lot of that. The little ball, the little metal bearing that had the sort of uh, plastic around it. Yep, exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I definitely spent a lot of time with that. That's kind of the closest to the hockey I ever got as that a kid. That was fun. Yeah, yeah, that's a great one. Yeah, hockey cards. That's so. When we're thinking about toys from the '80s and the '70s and the '90s, or whenever, whenever you were born, toys kind of range, right? Everyone thinks, oh, like Tonka toys or something like that. It doesn't have to be. It's kind of what we remember as being fun and stuff that we we played with or friends of ours had. There's always that toy that a friend had that we went over to their house because their parents bought it for that kid, and unfortunately, we never had it. So that happens. And one of those toys for my number five list is Big Wheel and the Green Machine. I, yeah. never, I never owned it, but... Uh, what? No, I never did, but people in my neighborhood had it. And the thing about the Big Wheel, which is awesome, it's really forward thinking. You got to think that the Big Wheel came out in the late 70s, and essentially it's a, it's a tricycle. It's three, plastic, it's three wheels, they're all plastic. You sit on it, you, you know, your legs are going, and you're steering it like this. And now those bikes are commonplace when you see people on bike paths and things like that. But you could ride around on this thing and it had a little e-brake that you could pull and it would do a 180 and a fishtail. So I really love the big wheel, a great toy. And unfortunately, I never had it. But uh... it actually spawned its own like cult following of people that would build their own. This is adults that would build their own and they, and they would put different uh, materials uh, on the wheels on the back too, to help them slide and do things. I can't remember what it's called, but it's like it's whole sport now because of that. So that's pretty, pretty crazy. Yeah, I definitely probably thought. people grew up. Yeah. And so I, I remember when we used to go over So my buddy uh, who just lived a few doors down, Tim Hardy, uh, he had one and they had the big plastic wheels on, on the back. And they used to get worn down because they're plastic. They were hard plastic. So when you'd skid, they started to, to really start to fray. And the problem is, is if you keep skidding on the same place, they turn round into kind of a square. And uh, they, were, they were awesome. They, they shouldn't have been called Big Wheel or Green Machine. They should be called Death Machines. Because the things that we would do in the 70s and 80s on these things, it's like, hey, Rob, go down – go down the hill and it's like sure let's do it and you're going down this hill and the grade is like this right and or you get your little brother to do it or something like hey go do it if you want to be cool go do this thing you go first yeah, yeah it's amazing that any of us made it out alive to be honest so there we go big wheel and green machine that would be my number five definitely so alex now we're moving on to number four what do you got well, yeah, again, uh, 90s kid, I'm, I'm kind of get, getting these out of the way first. But uh, for me, it would have to be the, uh, the Game Boy Color that I got. Um, well, Game Boy Color first came out in uh, North America in 1998. So I was five years old. Uh, and I remember uh, opening it up on Christmas and not really knowing what it was. Um, yeah, I hadn't really had any introduction to video games prior to that point. Um, and for those that don't know, the, the Game Boy Color was uh, Nintendo's um, handheld uh, portable uh, gaming device. Uh, the Color was the second edition. There was an original just Game Boy that came out a couple of years before that. This is uh, new and improved now with Color. Now with Color. If you combine the Game Boy and the Game Boy Color, they are third in sales uh, for any video game system of all time. Uh, uh -huh. Right now, uh, still hold that hold uh, the third spot record there, um, and it was such a huge trend for all of my friends. Like we would, I remember we'd go to school, and it became an issue. The teacher would have to talk about us having our Game Boys. We would all sit around on recess, just in a circle, playing whatever Pokemon or um, you know uh, Kirby, uh, like all kinds of different Nintendo games. Um, and uh, the most interesting thing, though, was the Game Boy Color didn't have a backlight feature. 
So it wasn't just uh, like monochromatic anymore in terms of the pixels, there was color to it, but you still had to have an adequate amount of lighting, which is just funny now that I think back to a time in my life when I had to have a screen that wasn't backlit. Right. And, uh, came out with little adapters and things you could hook onto them and they would have lights that all would shine down so you could see what you were doing. And um, there was no uh, like rumble packs built into the games, but every once in a while you'd have a game cartridge that came with its own rumble pack. So the game- What's a rumble pack? So the game, so the, you know, when you're playing a video game- Does that now, vibrate? Like, controller will vibrate or it's part oh, of okay. to bring you in. So this is when they were first coming out with that technology and on the portable handheld, uh, you know, uh, Game Boy, there wasn't any rumble things built into it, but the cartridge on the back, they actually built in the cartridge this rumble pack, so it would kind of shake the whole thing as you were playing it, and you had to have a separate battery that would insert in there, and that's another thing too. It wasn't, uh, you had to use your um, your AA uh, batteries, uh, which we just burned through. I remember oh, yeah. that big thing, yeah. So Before the, the, the funny device. thing about that, Alex, is so you had the Game Boy, but Nintendo goes back 20 years when they had their initial little controllers. And this is where it came from. And it was an uh, LCD screen. And it was like um, Donkey Kong. And they only had like three different things that you could do on them, but you could move them across the screen and you have two buttons. Do you remember that, Jason? Those little uh, Nintendo ones they had, they, they would flip open and they'd close. Nintendo's too young for me. It's like that's, yeah. Well, no, that would have been in the late seventies. I know, but I yeah, but I was. Oh no, that if it's that old, I don't remember. But like the Nintendo stuff that I remember, that was like the the ninety early nineties, and I yeah. was into PC games, so I missed the whole Nintendo thing until a yeah. little bit of Super Nintendo later. But which we did in an earlier episode that you should check out. We did. So, so the funny thing is, so he's talking about the, uh, the Game Boy. I'm going to jump in here with my number four as well. So this is going to go back. This was my video game as I was growing up as a five and six year old because they didn't have Nintendo. So what it was is there was an awesome game that spent hours playing and it was Water Ring Toss. And what Water Ring Toss was, was the thing about this tall, you'd fill it with water and you'd have these two buttons that would push uh, air and these rings would float up and you try to f get the rings where they fall on top of this thing. That was called water ring toss. Jason, do you remember? It was a video game? No, it was, a, it was a, just a little thing. It was like the size of a book. And I'm going to put the picture down below. But it had, you actually had to fill it with water and just push air so these rings would go up and float. You tried to Oh, so like a little fish tank and you'd, you'd, the air would push the things up in it. Yeah. And oh, I don't know so it's, but later versions were self-contained and they had like whatever leveling liquid is in levels right and you would push the buttons and then the, the air pockets would bubble up and you'd have to try and set them into the little uh kind of like a ring toss game uh -huh. but yeah okay yeah so they're kind of like pinball but vertical liquid yeah things. yeah so water ring down. toss that was that was my game boy color back uh in the 70s cool <laughs> Okay, Jason. That's old. Your... That's old. That's old school. I know. What's your number four, my friend? Okay. Well, you would talk about old school. I'm Hot Wheels, little uh, little car things. Yep. And I was really into them for a while. I don't have any of them anymore. It's been a long, long time, and it'll tie into some of the future things I'm going to mention here. But, but yeah, I had tons of hot wheel things and other whatever brands that still were the same roughly the same size matchbox like matchbox maybe that's what some yeah. of the other ones were it's that like i said so long ago but i just remember having tons of these cars and uh did you have the stuff. track did you have the tracks in the hot wheels that would go down in the loops and stuff no i played with mine mainly outside okay cars, oh, cars I... were ca cars were an outside thing yeah so that's where I did those, and I'll get to where I played with them. But I also had car car related. I'm not a car guy. I'm probably the most non car guy of anyone that anyone knows. But um, not as and I'm not anti car. Like not one of that kind of level of thing. Just not that interested in cars anymore. But there was also a buddy of mine had had a bigger. They had a big giant rec room in their basement. They had these other cars that they were you put them on this electric track it was a black track and it had these kind of like rails on it and the cars went on there 
and somehow they were electric powered and you had these little controls that you could move them faster and slower with and there was different kind of cars you could put it you could build the track but you needed a big room and i never had those myself so i only vaguely remember but it was a nice treat going over there and so i'm going to jump in here and i know this is going off the hot wheels but what you're talking about are called slot cars and slot cars there was a company named tyco and tyco would make these and you could buy all these different types of cars and they had little motors in them and the cars would fit on the track and they'd have a little metal thing that would fit in a groove and that would yeah the have groove the, yeah electricity running around it and that's what would kind of like model trains but for the yeah for the 70s 80s instead of instead of the 50s 60s amazing uh, my buddy rob riley uh he had them i remember going to his house and they're awesome and you could get so many different cars and they were just really cool looking so that's a great well, what, what later became really neat about those is that uh depending on the different cars that you were able to come out with and the more uh sort of uh i guess portable or uh, customizable the tracks became with their pieces mm -hmm. uh, I had a set that had uh, you know kind of just your average starter kit but it was cool because you could do the traditional sort of donut shaped ring or you could take the longer pieces out and make it a smaller circle or do a longer track with curves in it as we got more uh, yeah figure eights they had some of those ones where you do the loop where it go really fast and 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 they designed them in a way that they the cars though you know they would have wider heavier cars that would stay on the track better for so they would be like more beginner level ones and then there were the smaller lighter cars and you know it was the same amount of electricity driving the car it was just how you could control the speed right and going too fast was sometimes a bad thing because you couldn't just sit there and pull the trigger all the way down because it had a little um uh you know uh a rheostat in there that would control how much current was going to your cars uh which would determine the speed so you'd have to kind of you know uh not get too ahead of yourself and just crank that button down because your car would just go foo, flying and launch across the the, the mm -hmm. place there and we ended up having to have sort of a designated crash wall because the cars would fly off and make marks in the wall so I remember that in an apartment, mm -hmm. we had to kind of <laughs> be aware of launching the cars. But. So that's really interesting, Alex, because so my buddy Rob, who had these, I remember there's different cars and people would bring over their cars, but some cars were faster than the others. And I didn't realize, I didn't know why. And yeah. it wasn't that they were bigger, but I was like, oh, I want to have the Trans Am because that was the fast one or whatever. So is that what it is? There's a limiter on it or something. So, well, depending on like when you pull the trigger, right? When you, it, depending on how the system is, like there's so many different ways that they do it, but essentially that's what your trigger is, is that it's going to control how much current your car gets by squeeze. Obviously when you squeeze it all the way down, that's the full speed and then having it fully released is nothing. And then that the motor is still in the car. So the car can have its own different motor sizes, which would affect that. Um, but then as well to what I found was, the the wider the car was and the lower that it was the better it was at staying in that groove as opposed to the smaller mm -hmm. skinnier cars or the more top heavy ones they were the ones that would fly off on the corners um but you know i i wasn't like super into it i had my own little set that i love to play with and have my friends over um but it's uh it's quite the like almost like model trains are right like there's people who get way into it and uh, they have full NASCAR tracks and they set up stands with little models and everything in there. So there's some yeah. pretty extreme uh, slot car out there for sure. So Jason, you were talking about the Hot Wheels and you say you never played with them inside. I think this is going to be a great lead. Well, not, not, not that I never played with them. I know, but I think this is a great lead into another toy, which we talked about. So why don't you talk about your next one? Okay. So my number three, which, because I thought I was going to be going in the opposite order. Um, my number three is sandbox slash dirt pile slash brick pile. So some of the best toys are free. So it was awesome. You had a sandbox and you could build anything you want with sand. It could be dry sand. You build certain things, certain amount of wet sand. You build things. You could build sand castles. You can build hills. So your Hot Wheels by themselves are like fine. They're cars. But a car by itself just going around on a flat, flat thing on your floor inside that's boring but when you could build a whole town and hills and stuff to go around and you so you're building your own track with in the sandbox where the cars can go and stuff and, mm -hmm. and of course then you got your construction your construction your tonka things and stuff which build the town first and then the hot wheels ones come in and do it so it was like sort of sim city before sim city um 
kind of thing where you'd build that. And then there was a dirt pile that got in and I'll get to one of the other later things where the brick pile comes in with the dirt pile. But the sandbox was more closely related to the Hot Wheel Tonka vehicle like things was building building cities out of, out of them and roads to, for the cars to be on. I used, I used, remember that? I used have, to love the, uh, the sandbox when I was uh, younger, but I actually have a funny story about being, uh, my mom kind of banned me from the sandbox. Uh, I believe I was either in grade one or two and uh, got out there. Uh, this was in my after school care. So after school, I was, uh, there was a little daycare sort of associated with it. And then we go out back to where the, uh, the long jump um, uh, sandbox was. And uh, I decided that it would be really fun to be buried. So all my friends and I, we dug the whole thing out. Like, like the entire sandbox, we almost dug the whole thing out, had all the sand pushed up onto the grass. And then I got in there and then they buried me in it, uh, which was awesome. Um, and except when I got out afterwards, I noticed that I had like literally thousands of little red bites all over me. I don't know. Yeah, if from those like, little sand bug things, whatever those were. That whatever it was, they were arriving and they were really pissed off that we dug up their nest i guess and then i buried myself but uh, so i got eaten alive and my mom was pretty pissed off about that i thought it was hilarious but yeah i was kind of banned from sandboxes so yeah that's a fun wow. memory that's crazy <laughs> so do you ever bury get buried when you go to the beach now no or are you i adverse to that yeah. now I, I never really thought about it but yeah I, I don't really like sign up to get buried in things anymore i that's probably that yeah <laughs> so do you avoid beaches do you like not like sand now i don't mind the sand i just uh yeah I just, so there's I, no lasting psychological scarring from this, this, wow. this well, maybe thingy, like the live thing this, yeah maybe maybe in there somewhere so i think every kid probably has a sandbox story or a, a thing like that so my story about having kind of like a, a dirt pile we used to have something called the dirt place on my road i was telling jason about this and it was basically an undeveloped lot and we would walk down with our cars or whatever and um so you know you know on the street you have your your childhood friends there so we had we had rob and we had tim and and then we had uh Doug and the other Rob and I just remember this vividly as us playing there because it was like it had clay there which was really cool that you could play with and yeah yeah because clay is better because it it holds together it's like super sand yeah and but we were kind of crazy so we we would do things again I made it out of the 80s alive we would get you know, like gasoline and like pour gasoline and light it on fire and be like look at the truck going through the fire like dumb <laughs> shit Totally dumb shit, but uh, super, super fun. So yeah, I remember the dirt place vividly and I was super sad when they developed a house on it because it took away this massive- Took away one of your best play toys. Amazing, right? And all gone. So there you go. Crazy. Uh, okay, so Alex, that he had the sand sandbox and the dirt po pile for his kind of number three. Uh, what's your number three, my friend? Uh, I went- with uh hungry hungry hippos definitely one of my favorites i guess it's a board game um i definitely growing up was not into board games which i very much changed um but that was one of my uh favorite games for sure i i don't probably just because i love to smash the hippos and they were eating stuff it, it i think it counts a, as a toy it's active enough that it's more toy like in a way sure. than, than a game it's and like, it was so simple and yet somehow it was definitely captivated uh, me for hours for sure playing with my friends so I definitely uh, one of my top games for sure so Alex this is the one of the things we talk about toys and when I, this is something I want to hear from the listening audience is what makes a toy now is a board game a toy is hungry 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 hippos a toy it's active as Jason just said so I think that anything that captures the imagination of a child can be considered a toy. Jeez, we just talked about dirt and sand. So why can't Hungry Hungry Hippos be a toy, right? Well, that's how like toys, honestly, that's how they started, right? It was like rocks and sticks and, yeah. you know, anything you could use your imagination to create a scene with. Um, yeah. You, know, uh, you play toys, with it and you're... Sticks, whatever, yeah. right? Interesting. So yeah, I guess I would make that a pass for sure. Hungry Hungry Hippos... <clears throat> yep. um, now, my number three, I, I have a long list here, but one that I'm going to throw in is, uh, again, from the probably late 70s, uh, early 80s, and this has a two-part story to it. Fisher-Price used to make 
uh, a ton of toys. But one that I really liked that they came out with was called the medical kit. And it was basically a kit that you would open and it had a stethoscope and had like something to test your reflexes. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. It had like a fake syringe that, you know, would have this little thing that would turn red. And, and it, not had red. The, it had the blood that they yeah. you'd put on. The, and uh, yeah. your blood pressure. So it was awesome. I loved it. And like, what young kid doesn't want to play doctor with you know so it was awesome uh so that's i really remember that but the problem is is as kids those pieces you know it's like hey i you're missing a piece right because kids lose stuff all the time and eventually by i don't know month three or month four there's like three items left and there's supposed to be nine right yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so Alex, with, with any kind of kit or something like that. Like I had a one for tools, like I had a little yeah. construction. It's like, where'd the hammer go? I have no idea. We moved, we moved now. And then you're listing more pieces, like whatever. Right. So those, those kind of things, they're, they're great toys, but yeah, eventually you, they slowly uh, just get lost piece by piece. Yeah. And it'd be yeah. very interesting to see because Fisher price has again, a ton of toys and the price on some of these today as collector's items are, we're not talking hundreds. We're talking like they can be in the thousands. It's nuts. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So there we go. That would be uh, one of mine, the Fisher price, uh, the medical kit. Cause I loved it. My dad was a doctor too. So maybe that's something to do with it. So sure. did you play operation also? Did play that, operation that and game where you had yeah. to go in and take the parts out without buzzing the thing and so that wasn't in my top list but of course oh, it's not a top i'm just it's not a top list but i mean it's, when you mentioned the medical thing that yeah it's awesome so there you go uh, okay alex we're gonna go back to you so now we're gonna go down to number two my number two and my number one are tied uh probably but i think uh overall i gotta start off my number two will be uh lego um and i remember my first Lego that I used uh, was my stepdad's and he was a set, I believe from the seventies or eighties where it was the astronaut space set. Was um, it the gray one, the nice gray ones with the white guys and red guys and yes. Yep. Yeah, exactly that. And, and their helmets, there was no visor or anything. You, you could slip the little helmet on, but it just had the cutout around their eyes. Um, yep very like base level uh lego back to you know where you got kind of the the two block and then the six from the talking about the number of uh prongs yeah. on it um yeah what a what an incredible toy i think overall my time spent with any toy is it lego wins out for sure um just because of the versatility or the different sets that i got again i was huge into star wars as a kid so uh i'd say that you know, 60% of my Lego was all specifically Star Wars themed. I had the Millennium Falcon, I had the Snow Speeder, I had the AT-AT. My little brother actually just finished building the Death Star uh, like last year. He got he got the Death Star, so wow. was kind of continue. But not at mini, not at minifig scale. No, uh, at, at the yeah, no, no, not 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 yeah. real life. But, I can uh, see it over there. Yeah, yeah, but it's That's uh, not a hill. That's a minifig Death Star. What an impressive, uh, impressive empire. I actually did a little research on, uh, on Lego and kind of how, it, but uh, it all started. So in 1895 was just when it was the wood shop. And then in 1932, uh, that's when they sort of started coming up with the concept of the blocks, the building blocks that would connect. And initially it was just sort of uh, the top blocks that were cut out on the top of them so that they could stack and not move laterally. Um, it wasn't until uh, later that they started cutting out the bottoms of the pieces too so that you could get that sort of that locking action. Yeah. And again, uh, primarily wood, sometimes metal. Um, and then if we move forward, uh, back in uh, 1939 was when they started uh, getting their patent for the interlocking plastic bricks which is really that's to me like you know you can look back on this and say when did lego get started to me that's kind of the when that first piece actually started coming out in the design stage that to me is when lego was born in my own personal opinion 
but then in 1960, they abandoned all of the wood and metal and moved completely to a plastic base and really like committed to that brand Lego and specifically stuck with that. There's a bit of a rift in the company actually where um, some of the toy makers that were all about the wood and metal toys actually left Lego and went off to build their own uh, toy company. So uh, Alex, let me jump in here. So. Uh, if I remember correctly, it was in 1939 that they started moving to plastic because metal was becoming very, um, they were using it for the war effort for World War II, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, and, that, and after that is when they just, they had kind of that option to get, because a lot of it was wood too, primarily, mm. uh, right? So it was kind of that debate in their mind as to, you know, what, how are we going to move forward here? And uh, I guess the plastic just... Uh, you know, seem to be, they, I think it was in 1939 as well, or uh, 19, right around there, but uh, early 40s, late 30s uh, is when they got their first injection, like plastic injection uh, mm -hmm. machines that they could actually, when they make each mold sort of start to um, mass produce mm -hmm. uh, Lego as, as a concept. Yep. Um, and I mean, now you can go to Lego stores nowadays and you can just see the, it looks like a grocery store. You're walking through there in the aisles with the bulk bins, all the different shapes and sizes and custom pieces and uh, figurines and just what a crazy empire. So the interesting thing about Lego, uh, have you ever seen the, the show on Netflix about the toys that made us with Lego before? I know I didn't see that. No. Okay. You need to see it because it kind of touches upon the things you're talking about. And I remember watching in there. So Lego has almost gone bankrupt uh, several times. And one of the things that brought them back from bankruptcy was when they got the license for star Wars. Right. So yeah. it's kids like you, you kept Lego going. Thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Probably. Cause they didn't, ha yeah, they didn't have Lego star Wars. Yeah, so uh, Lego, obviously a huge one. And that actually kind of ties in with Jason's, I'm going to say his number one. Uh, my number one, yeah. You got to show it, dude. Okay, so I'm going to skip my number two and go to my number one because my number one is Lego. <laughs> oh, here we go. Okay, so I still have some of my Lego. And my Lego stuff is from the 70s. So I like the medieval and the science fiction stuff, which is why I'm such a fantasy science fiction geek to this day because that's what all still still runs me so, so this is original what you're about to show huh this is original and a good friend of mine got me a replacement of this so this is not my original one but this is the same model oh, that i had that's awesome so yellow yellow lego castle with mini figs nice wow Love it. And it's funny because it's over the years, the, the bricks got more, uh, they got smaller, more angles. You could do more things with them. I mean, that's lost a guard. Yeah. But if you look at that thing, it's, it's pretty basic, right? You know, it's, yeah. it's pretty basic, but it still has like lots of cool things. Yeah. It's not the it, best set up for this, but it has lots of cool things. Yeah, in my, in my opinion, you, you don't need any crazy, like, you don't even have to have gray pieces to have that work, right? Like, you can do whatever you want. Some of my Drawbridge favorites... works. This isn't going to work holding it this way. Things, <laughs> still it... Swing, things still swing open. I've got the horses. I've got the little flags. All the stickers are still on. Hey, can you do me a favor, Jason? Can you pull out one of the knights and just put them closer to your camera for me? Yep, sure. And Alex, the crazy thing is, is they spawned uh, cartoons, like Lego cartoons, right? Yeah, so. I was going to talk about the movie franchise. It's, it is really an empire awesome. now that they built yeah. um, with the Lego movies. And I, I don't know if you've, have you seen the Lego movie? There's, there's, a, there's a bunch of them now, but have you seen like the Lego movie? The first, not, no, not the first. I, actually, I never have. And I, I know about it. I just, I never have. It's, it's, it's really well done, actually. And it, it's, uh, yeah, with uh, the one I'm referring to, I think it was just called the Lego movie uh, with, um, Will Ferrell plays the dad and just what a what an amazing story and just such a funny concept too because it was always a toy I think that interacted the most with my other toys as well so mm -hmm. if I had like a plastic dinosaur or uh, something else what, whatever that would be I would interact it with my Lego world Lego was kind of that uh, limitless yeah. uh, whatever scenery I needed to make or whatever setting yeah. I needed to 
I would create the setting and then fill it with my toys. Um, you know, I'll, I'll talk about my, what I said was my favorite toy uh, and how yeah. much they interacted with my Lego uh, sets. Um, and what, what, what a fun toy too, that you can, as you build it, you can smash it, you can break it apart and it's pretty indestructible. Like, uh, you know, I very rarely ever broke any of my Lego. I think the Lego actually did more breaking of me, you know, when you're cleaning up and you forget that one piece yeah. and you're it's it's on that. And, oh my God. Yeah. Some of the most painful it, stuff ever. It, but Lego, made, Lego was amazing. It's, it's not just the toy itself, but it's a changing of an entire mindset. Like Lego totally shifted way of thinking like modular thinking mm -hmm. it's yep. lego is the ultimate toy because the problem with modern toys and even modern lego too many things are pre-built that you want to get something so okay you just get it you buy it off the rack it's the way it is you don't have to do stuff with it you had to use your imagination yes you came with instructions so you could build the castle the way it is here but that was just the start but then from there, then you would take that and you take the piece and you're like, oh my God, I've got more Lego pieces. I'm going to build a bigger castle. My castle is going to go like this. I'm going to get these different colors of pieces and do this in there. It was, it, and then you're like, oh, but I want to build this other thing with it. It was the creativity of being able to do it and just take these little chunks, whether they're a one thing chunk or two thing chunk or three or whatever it was. And you'd start thinking about how to build things up. And then that just changed my whole way of thinking about everything. It's like, how do you get things to be modular where this part plus this part plus this part equals something else? And you understand anything. You break it down to its parts, and then you can build new things. You take an idea, break it down to its parts, build new things. But if you, if you just have everything prepackaged for you, you miss out on, on so much that I think for training kids to think for themselves, Lego is a tremendous tool for freedom of thought, creativity, all kinds of and also, also to follow instructions though too right like it, it does yeah. definitely a lot of like hey yeah you can mess around with it and do what you want but you better not forget step six otherwise you're you know my well, right but what, that's when you're learning that's the beginner one is the beginner thing is you follow the instructions you learn how to go but that's life right you follow the things you know we get into the shuha re thing if we were doing martial arts but it's like you could go into where you follow the instructions you do it the way it's supposed to be done you learn the way it is and then later on then you know how the system you know, by doing by following the rules you learn how the system works then you can apply the system to build what you want and then your creativity comes in and then it explodes if all you do is follow the rules and build what's there you're missing so much of the fun of the toy and so much yeah. of the fun of life so yeah. there's so many different Lego sets, guys, and, and uh, different things that came out over the years. And I spent hours playing Lego as well. Uh, one of my fondest memories I have is when we used to go traveling or I was a little kid and say we we're going on a plane somewhere. For some reason, gift shops and, and airports seem to have the, like the small Lego, like, hey, we're going to, you can build a little motorcycle. And I just remember, you know, my mom buying me one of those and it just it would keep me occupied. But it was neat yeah. because it would just be, and then you could take that and put it to into the medieval set, or it didn't matter. Right? Other thing, yeah, I can lower my drawbridge. I can drive the motorbike on the drawbridge. Exactly. Those yeah. Little horses there, right? I can get another thing that's got wings. You can take your your plastic dinosaurs. They can come and invade your Hot Wheels town like Godzilla and eat things, and then they can smash through the wall of your Lego castle, and the wall gets broken apart. But then you can put the wall back together. Your toy's not broken, like you're saying. They're hard to break, but they're also breakable at the same time. So you can smash them and put them back together. Yeah. It's wonderful. You can have castle ruins if you want to do the things. It's another really important thing too is that Lego could be an entire like family activity. Like I've definitely played Lego with my parents before, uh, with my friends, their older brothers, younger brothers, older sisters, you whatever you name it. Uh, a person is like capable of playing with Lego as long as they're not going to choke on it at an infant stage, but <laughs> three and up or whatever it is. See, so that very, very interesting that you, because this is actually going to go into my number two uh, pick, what you just said about choking on small pieces. Yeah. So he, here's the thing. Toys have changed over the years and we have to now be given instructions not to uh, eat toys, not to put plastic bags <laughs> overhead, not to inject disinfected into our bodies to cure COVID. I mean, it, it, these ridiculous things are coming out. However, in the 1970s and the 1980s and, and prior to that, there were no instructions. Typically, there were kids who were pioneers that discovered what you're not supposed to do with everything. Um, there is probably 100,000 uh, kids walking around in their mid-40s with one eye right now because they're the reason that toys changed, right? <laughs> 
Yep. So one yep. of the one of the toys that I absolutely loved as a as a kid in the late 70s and 80s was Battlestar Galactica toys. And oh. they had the Viper and the Cylon Raider. And these yep. were amazing, really cool toys. But the thing about them that was really neat is they had little missile ports that you could launch and they would actually come out and they'd fire. However, some kid lost his eye, another one choked on it, another one got lodged in the nose, could never get it out. So the manufacturers eventually took the Battlestar Galactica Viper and the Cylon Raider, and when you push the button for the release, they would go click, and they would just come out like an inch, and then you push right. them back in because they couldn't be released, and it's like, oh, we don't want kids to, to blind themselves now. So Battlestar Galactica stuff, loved it, very cool, didn't have a lot of it. Uh, and that kind of, I'm going to say this ties with my other favorite toy for number two, which was G.I. Joe. Now, Alex, you and I talked about G.I. Joe in, in I think, episode two uh, of the Taurus podcast. Yeah. Um, we went into that, but G.I. Joe stuff, massive. Uh, yeah. And everyone has different action figures that they love. Yeah, like action figures, it's its own subgenre. It, it totally you know, is. An episode more, just on action figures. Right. And, you know, and I'm sure we're going to be talking about some other action figures in a moment. But my point being is G.I. Joe for me was awesome because you'd have the different characters, the different names, the different vehicles that they could have. <clears throat> and Alex, you and I would talk about, uh, uh, I was talking about the aircraft carrier that G.I. Joe had as a toy, which was a massive. You massive... had an aircraft carrier? Yeah, the flag. It was, it was amazing. And only one kid in 100,000 ever had it because it was 149.99 uh and wow most, yeah and that's you, like a thousand dollars in now money it's crazy it's crazy so i'm going to be putting the different pictures as i'm talking about gi joe and having snake eyes and having uh oh. all, the, all the all the different um toys on there amazing so gi joe definitely my huge one i would spend hours in the dirt place with them playing with them so that's my number two loved it action figures amazing so action figures, there's, there's so much with action figures. I remember, I remember the Battlestar Galactica you started with. Yeah, you had the Cylons, you had the silver Cylons, and then you had, like, there was a gold Cylon. You had that guy with the brain, like 1970s Battlestar Galactica. I saw yeah. a lot of people watching or thinking of the newfangled one. Cylons looked different back then. So, um, yeah, so they had the brain guys with the cloaks and, and stuff. And then you had the... the yeah, the, the, there was the action figure size ones, and then there was the little ones that you had, like for the Vipers and the yeah. Cylon Raiders with the ships that had the little or smaller guys, smaller guys in them. I also, there was also uh, Buck Rogers toys were in the same era, so you could yeah. have them across. But the, and the Star Wars ones, like those, those yeah. were like the, the hugest. And so much of the Star Wars thing, some of those characters, I mean, the reason Boba Fett is so, became what he is, is because of the action figure. Yeah. But it's in so many of those guys, the most obscure guys, like, why do you know who IG-88 is? Because of the action figure. It's not from the movie that you remember IG. It's like, it's like, boom, because you had all these guys and you made all these, these sorts, like so many, so many Star Wars things, whether it was like the, the Hoth Ice Base or the Millennium Falcon. Um, oh, I so, I mean, that's going to go into one of your, one of your favorite toys. I think we're going to talk about in a sec, but before we do, and before I leave GI Joe, the really cool thing about GI Joe is also a comic book, but they would introduce characters into GI Joe that were real people. For example, uh, William, the refrigerator Perry, who, who played football, who's a bass guy. He was a GI Joe guy. They had Rocky. Rocky was turned into a GI Joe. Wow, I did not know that. Yeah, so they had all these kind of amazing uh, things that would that would happen. Yeah, and they had the little things on the back of the card, like the package, the back of the card thing. You yeah, know. it would tell their it rank. It would tell yeah. their rank and what their special abilities are, uh, what so their code name, code name, yeah. and, and usually most of the, like Snake Eyes, it's like real name, and it would be like you know classified. Just but yeah, 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 stuff like that. So yeah, it wasn't just the toy itself, but there was something to having the packages and and stuff for all of the, and all the, the accessories and yeah but the precursor to gi joe because gi joe had the kung fu grip and it started to have more articulation yeah, but, but now these are you're talking about the newfangled gi joes because i'm not my, talking about the 12 inch no yeah because my uncles had the like the bigger yeah. 
I'm talking yeah, about the action giant, figure. giant ones. That's that's before me. Yeah, we're talking about the three and a half inch. But I mean, the precursors to that is going to actually bleed into yours, Jason, which is yeah. what started probably the action but video. But before that, I just got to get a Star Wars thing. Back in a second. I see it on the shelf over here. Okay. So you know that what he's about to talk about is probably Star Wars. And Alex is a massive Star Wars fan. Um, so Alex, did you ever play with action figures, Star Wars action figures? I had a couple, uh, you know, the odd birthday, a family member get me one or the other. I never collected specifically those action figures. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. Wow. Oh, yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> but what I, what I got really into is uh, Star Wars minifigures is what they were called. And it's okay. kind of like to play a Dungeons and Dragons uh, uh, uh board game style star wars uh where you you'd amass an army and you'd, you'd say you'd have 500 points and your opponent would have 500 points each different figure would have a different point value you'd have to build your armies and then you'd have to fight each other on different like battle maps or whatever those that was sort of one of the main star wars toys specifically that i purchased mm -hmm. uh, awesome. was like mini figures yeah so jason did you have a favorite star wars figure that you just thought was really cool. Everyone has one. There's so many, but out of things that, I mean, there's the obvious ones that people like, you know, like the Darth Vader's and stuff like that. And, you know, it was really great having Boba Fett with the slave thing and stuff. Yeah. But one guy that I thought looked really cool that I'm going to put this out there because because I don't remember what his name is and stuff, but he looked cool. It's, Trivia time, a, here it comes. There's like a silver robot guy with a kind of mouth thing that comes out like that. And I don't know what he is, but uh, he just looked really cool. So I ended up using him as like, he's like an ultimate extra. He's not, he's, he's like the candy bar guy from Die, from Hard. Die Hard in in my Star Wars things. He never was the main character. I know what you're was, talking about. But he yeah. was always, he was always, whatever thing you were setting up with your things, he was always in there. Like he wasn't C-3PO. He yeah. wasn't, he wasn't a stormtrooper. He wasn't Boba Fett. He wasn't any of the other things. He wasn't the cantina people, but yet he always had a cameo in everything that I was building. Cause he just had a nice silvery thing. Just like the Cylons. I like the. I so like one, of, the, one of the, the cool things the about the chromey looking things, the star Wars figures, which was hilarious is when you'd have Darth Vader or Luke or Obi-Wan, anyone who had a lightsaber, the lightsaber would be in the arm and you would push it up. And oh, it, yeah, yeah, the arm thing, yeah. That would make a great tattoo. <laughs> Just thinking, seeing, your, seeing your arm there, that would be a great tattoo thing to have on there. How many people would get that if they saw that tattoo? Oh, but everyone awesome. talks about the different Star Wars toys. It's like, oh, I had Slave One or the Millennium Falcon. I had the Millennium Falcon, loved it. Yeah. Um, and again, there are thousands well, of dollars. What's that behind you there? Hey, you got an AT-AT right there. So, an can, you, amazing... can you just reach? Can you just reach back there out of? Here, I will see if I can do this here. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. F yeah. at AT is amazing. So, uh, that was such a cool toy too. That was huge. But there's so many, man. There's, yeah, I, there's, there's I think so what, yeah. what Star Wars did really well is that, you know, when George Lucas was creating the movies, they, the, uh, you know, the, the partners and everything that he was with said, okay, well, we'll take 100% of the movie sales and give you the rights to everything else. <laughs> right. Like, hell yeah, let's do it. Like, he believed that what he was creating was more than just a story or just a movie. Yeah. And so that was, I think, a big part of LucasArts' uh, growth and expansion was that was yeah. primarily his means of, uh, you know, continuing on the, the stories and the movies. Well, they, and made, they made more money on the toys initially uh, from Kenner than they did the movie itself. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. But and the initial deal, and it, well, George Lucas especially, because his, his deal was like, you won't see the movie sales profits. It will be specifically the rights to the toys and all the merchandising and everything because yeah. they didn't believe that it was going to be as huge yeah. a thing as it was. Awesome. Um, Change and, merchandising yeah, forever. Well, while we're on Star Wars toys, I can't believe we haven't talked about the most important one of all, 
which is lightsabers. Did you guys growing up? I don't know if that was just me, but like I've had so many different lightsabers and I've broken them oh, yeah. over so many of my friends. Like, what an amazing toy. Lightsabers were one of those toys. They did come out and I mean, they were just big plastic tubes, but it, they came out. I don't know if I'm remembering this right. I probably am not, but I don't remember lightsabers being the toy. It was more the action figures rather than like, hey, we have a life size. I know that there probably was, but we, 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 we had not, them. But my, my friends and I, that's what we did was we had like the little lightsaber and it was kind of like a baton, like like a folding out baton. So you yeah. have to like yeah. hang it and it would go like, and it was all these plastic things. Different qualities would allow you to hit your friends at different rates. Um, but, uh, you know, they, they had ones that would light up, make sounds. Yep. Um, yeah, my, my girlfriend Caitlin actually has a replica Mace Windu um, lightsaber that Disney released uh, when I think the Clone Wars came out, um, and so she has that. It's got the the purple light and everything. Yeah, the purple one. Yeah, so very, she has it like nearby. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll see. We'll see if we can procure it for you for in a couple minutes. Love we'll it. See if, if, yeah, and have it come in with the lights off and. Yeah, yeah, if it'll make an appearance. I don't know if it still has the batteries in it even right now, but anyway, yeah, a lightsaber, what a cool, like, for me and yeah. my group of friends, yeah. that's definitely such a huge uh, toy in the Star Wars franchise, for sure. Actually, now, with last time I was at Universal Studios, uh, it's obviously Disneyland is, and all those that probably totally changed now, but there used to be a build-your-own-lightsaber station, and you could build it, customize it with different colors and, uh, you know, the two double-edged lightsaber or, um, you know, the, the lightsaber fandom has just exploded. Yeah. And people are still trying to come up with more realistic ways to make that weapon. People are trying to make that weapon for real. Like, for real. I've, like, I've seen I, it on YouTube. It's crazy. Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. Because the, you, the one that I've seen is they, it looks like a lightsaber, everything the same. And it's a piece of metal that heats up and it's connected to this battery which is like four like four feet across and it burns through things and it's awesome looking but it weighs like 80 pounds so the guy's like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 so i'm definitely if i if i could have like one toy that like came to life it'd probably be the lightsaber just because that'd be such nice. a cool thing to have good yeah well we're gonna we're going to move along from Star Wars, and now we're going to kind of head into our kind of our number ones. Um, I know that Jason already talked about Lego and Lego Castle being his number one, so he's going to kind of have to okay. switch it around. But my, we're talk- my number two will fit in it. Okay. Right. So what we'll do, we'll start with Alex now with his number one of his number one toy. My number one uh, is going to have to be uh, Army Men, specifically the little green plastic figures. Uh, if you've seen the movie Toy Story, think the the Toy Story guys. Yeah, yeah exactly. all the different uh, positions. The guy with the bazooka, he's always kneeling, one knee up, one knee down. Yeah, with the that was always my favorite guy. Um, you know, uh, my dad uh, started me off with a small set, and he brought home a because they just came in plastic bags from the dollar store when I got them. Yeah. Um, but what he did is he ripped open the plastic bag and he put it into uh, a fifty cal ammo container. Cool. Uh, so yep. all my army guys came in the. Eventually, I had to get like a big bin for them because they quickly yeah go from that size. But that was my first army man experience, and I used to take it. I used to take that ammo container everywhere with me because it was an indestructible container mm-hmm. with a pretty indestructible toy. Like army guys are pretty good. Like Lego is definitely indestructible and hurts five times as much to step on, but army guys also did their own fair share of damage to my feet for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, they're not yeah, totally indestructible because you could take the take the matches and the flamethrower guy could melt oh, yeah, the other yeah. guys, but yeah, you, but you could, not that that ever happened. But yeah, well, and that's the thing, magnifying glasses. Like I, you know, you would you would melt them or break them or do whatever. But uh, yeah, definitely a really uh, fun toy, and I built full battle scenes again, incorporating Lego. We're taking them to the beach, but I think just in terms of a toy that really kind of came around with me wherever and. Um, you know, uh, I, I got sets on them. They, they came with little plastic bunkers um, yep. and tanks, helicopters, uh, uh, you, you name it. I, I probably had it, and I definitely uh, love to war game it out with those, so for sure. It's funny that you say that, Alex. My favorite Army Man toy, and I don't know why, was like the 
uh, heavy machine. It was like the 50 cal machine and the guy who would lay down. And oh. I don't know yeah. why that was my favorite army, man. I don't know why, but <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. And the great thing about that toy is it didn't have any moving parts. So it's no. one of those toys, which the, this was a moving part. The, yeah. It's the mind, which the kid, that's, would that's the most important moving part of all these great toys. So it's creating this atmosphere and what's going on. It didn't have to be like a transformer, which we didn't even mention, you know, which were awesome, but it's just, it was different. Yeah. We, yeah. We could probably get a guest on some day to talk about transformers. So, so Jason, you had army man on your list as well, right? Army man was number two on my list. So Alex and I have the reverse opinion of number one and number two. It's so close. Yeah. Army men, it was, they, they were so cool. There were so many of them. And my favorite one though, was the parachute guys. Cause oh, they were yes. army men, but they had the parachutes and you you'd throw them up, oh, throw them up yes. and they'd come down to parachute guys. It was like awesome. Threw them off the balcony in my apartment. Yeah. I did, you, I did all kind, and that's why I like army men for me top Lego is because I tended to do crazier shit with my army men than I did with my Lego. Yeah. Um, Lego in itself is more like building and self-contained. There's a lot of pieces, whereas the army men, like I'm sure I've lost hundreds of them, but they were so cheap and you know easy to fix. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I had one or two that were my favorites that I would like color on with crayon or like Marcus helmet, like he's the captain or whatever, right? Like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You get the things and you'd paint paint the things on. Yeah, they'd get different colored. A bunch of mine were painted with different colored uh, helmets yeah. and little mark markings and stuff. I guess hierarchy and rank were important to me at some point for some <laughs> yeah. reason. I did a lot of that. And the favorite one is I ended up, I don't know what I did, but I traded someone for this stuff. I, and it was, a, it was like a, it was a German, like Maginot, like fortress thing that it was like this, I don't know how to describe it. Kind of like later with like the Grayskull castle thing, but it was like this, this plastic fortress that was this, underground bunker thing with all these nazi things so that that my allies could come and attack it and stuff that, cool. was, that was great but then this is but then that was cool as again like just like the lego it's like the starter set but then you're like well that's okay but i can do better than that because i got a freaking brick pile here so i've got yeah. bricks cinder blocks dirt and sand yeah. like okay your plastic thing is all cool and fine but now I can build a fortress that's going to be just this monster thing, like this giant Egyptian complex. And then, so you'd build all the passageways through the bricks and guys would be guarding this and they could climb up and do, oh yeah. It's like- My dad, my dad was really big into sandcastle building. So we'd go to the beach and he would spend like hours making these sandcastles. And then at the end, that was always my thing is I got to play with the army men on them. And you yep. know, that was fun is blowing up the, the sandcastles with your army guys, so. Yeah, definitely, definitely lost. And you can take, you ever take like the elastics too, and then you got like the army men. You set them up, and then yeah, you take the shoot. elastics and yeah. bang and shoot them, and boom, and, and yeah. pick the pick the guys off and stuff. We had some great wars doing doing stuff yeah. like that. It's absolutely amazing how like instantaneously you turn into a child when you start talking about toys, right? You and your, yeah. your memory goes back to there. And army men was one that I loved as well. Wasn't my number one. But did love it. So my number one is it's actually toss up. I have a number one, and then I have my ultimate, and that's what I have to do. I have to do it this way. So we've talked about different toys. Obviously, um, He Man didn't make our list, uh, which is a great toy. Lots of toys. Transformers we didn't talk about. Love Transformers didn't talk about. We can name thousands. Yeah. But there was a there was a toy that I I don't know why I love so much, but it it fascinated me and the toy was called stompers and what stompers was was stompers is. <clears throat> it was a little tr truck like this with foam wheels that would fit one double a battery in it and you turn it on and it would just go and it would just move so it looked like bigfoot you know like the big truck that one okay and that's that's really what it was and they were called stompers and i absolutely loved it because you could play outside you could go through water on mud and again they, oh, were, okay. they were only about that big but <laughs> i loved the stomper thing and they would come in like different truck you can different ones so that was my number one and i don't know why uh i think as a kid because i went to a couple of those like monster truck uh 
things and Bigfoot and uh, monster yeah. truck, 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 rally. Exactly. Rally, 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 rally. Yeah, yeah. So loved it. So Stompers was, was a big one, a pretty obscure. I don't think a lot of people remember it or know it, but that would be my number one. It is not my ultimate, but it is my number one. Very cool. So nice. we have talked about different toys and I think there's a, probably a couple others that we can have some honorable mentions. <clears throat> and so these will be just quick honorable mentions of toys that we remember from our childhood. A couple of my uh, honorable mentions are micro machines. Really love them. Very, very small cars that would open up the trunk and the hood. It was kind of like Hot Wheels, but they were just on a, like a micro level. Loved micro machines. That was definitely up there. Uh, a toy that I really loved, uh, which came out in the <clears throat> late 70s, 80s, was called Simon. And Simon was this game that you'd have several double D batteries in, and it would have different four different colored pads. And basically, it would go beep, beep, Oh, that thing. Okay. To, and it would go faster and faster, and you'd have to rely on the tone and your memory to get it correct. So love Simon. Great, great toy. Uh, Micro Machines, Simon, another one that was really, really uh, quite cool, which I, it was educational, but Speak and Spell. I love Speak and Spell. It, it was... Um, it was just a neat thing from Texas Instruments, I remember, and it would just kind of help you with your spelling and things like that. So those are some of my honorable mentions. We uh, chatted for over an hour about uh, different toys and we could go on and on, but on I am gonna leave on. off with my ultimate toy, which I said that I was gonna talk about. And this goes above my number one. And the reason it went above my number one is, as Jason had already talked about, is the most powerful thing in toy culture is your imagination. And this is one of the reasons that I think that we are attracted to role-playing games. Now, we didn't mention Dungeons and Dragons per se, so this is kind of a crossover between the two. I used to, when I was a young kid, would collect lead figurines of Dungeons and Dragons, uh, different things, rangers, monsters, you name it. And I had the ability to paint them. And so I would spend hours and hours painting these very small figurines and taking a, manic a meticulous time just, just painting them. It, they weren't, you know, I, I was priding myself on getting, oh, I've got the cross on the shield, everything. And, you know, we're talking about things that are about this big. Yeah. So those lead figurines really, really were one of those toys that I absolutely loved uh, when I played D&D. I would have them off in the corner on my piece of paper, and this is my representation. So Jason knows exactly. I can tell by his smile. Yeah, yeah um, and we've got a whole other conversation to do about that sometime, yeah. Yes, and so I hadn't got back into the lead figurine thing, uh, and then a few years ago, Jason and I were talking about it, and he's like, oh, you know, they still make them, right? And I'm like, no, they don't. And he shows me his little collection that he has, but they do still make them. They are way more expensive now, but <laughs> they're awesome. We appreciate you guys tuning in. And uh, as we always say on the Torvis podcast, keep on geeking on. Geeking on. <laughs> Middle butt. I love it. Caitlin is telling you how to use the lightsaber, yeah. sir. Middle button. Center button. Oh, <laughs> what? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah.